Amen. That's real good. Could you turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18 with me tonight, please? 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse 18. First Thessalonians five eighteen. And uh, the scripture says in First Thessalonians five eighteen, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Father, bless your word now. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. This past Sunday I talked about the pilgrims, 1620, and they landed at Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts. Forty miles of wilderness separated them from the uh, Bay, uh, uh, what was it, the Bay Company in, of uh, the Puritans in Massachusetts. But the Pilgrims and the Puritans are separated by far more than 40 miles of wilderness. They're separated by their uh, basic beliefs and what uh, motivates them and what they're about. The King of England was Henry VIII in the 1500s. He went through wife after wife after wife trying to get a male heir to the British throne. Henry VIII was a persecutor of Christians. Uh, you don't hear a whole lot about it, but uh, you hear about Hitler and you hear about Stalin and you hear about these people. And the reason you do is because they're modern and they had the, they had the power and control over huge armies. But if Henry VIII had had that, he would have been just as much a monster as Adolf Hitler. He was a monster in his own right. And he had innocent people put to death uh, for, his own, uh, for his own designs. He had a daughter with his wife, Catherine of Aragon. She was a Spanish woman. The daughter's name was Mary, uh, Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary was the Queen of England. And during her reign as the Queen of England, she had over 300 people burned at the stake for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. She wanted to turn England back into a Roman Catholic country. When Henry VIII was the king, because the Pope would not annul one of his marriages, then he withdrew and separated from the church in Rome and essentially became the head of his own church, which was the Anglican or Episcopal Church. So from that moment on, there was a great struggle in Great Britain for power, a great struggle for authority between the Catholic Church and the Church of England or the Anglican Church. And under, under, under Henry VIII, uh, the Anglican Church obviously grew. But when Mary became the queen, she married Philip of Spain. And Philip of Spain was a rabid Roman Catholic. And so the two of them together tried to stamp out Protestantism completely from the uh, British Empire. And uh, they killed a lot of people. They burned them at the stake. Smith, Smithfield in England is one famous place, if you want to call it famous where many, 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 many of our brothers and sisters died at the hands of this monster. She's called Bloody Mary. And she passed on and Elizabeth followed. She became the Queen of England. And she tried everything she could to do to stamp out Roman Catholicism and bring Anglican, uh, the Anglican worship back into England or the Episcopal worship. And in her own right, she was about as much of a persecutor as Mary. It was one uh, monstrous monarch after another, one after another, that caused the pilgrims to finally say, enough is enough. We've had enough of this church. We've had enough of Great Britain. We're leaving. The Puritans tried to reform the church. They tried to stay in it, reform it, and they couldn't do that. You'll never reform something like that. But to this very day, it has never been reformed. It's not saying that there aren't true believers in the Anglican Church. There probably are. God's the judge of that. No question about that. But as far as the church itself is concerned, if you look at Great Britain and look at some of the stuff that they believe, some of the, head, the heads over there, that church, 
it, it's, it's an amazing thing when you consider the fact that, uh, for example, Charles, who's first in line under Queen Elizabeth, who has been the longest in line of any uh, monarch, uh, he's, I don't know what, 50 years or 60 or whatever, since she was the Queen of England, he's been the first in line since he was born. He's 64, 65 years old. He's been in line all this time, and he has a very, very liberal, uh, universalist type religion. And he's in, 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 not in my book, and I don't think in your book, if you knew much about him, you'd consider him to be a Christian. And there's a lot of that, a lot of it in Great Britain. It's sad. And Queen Elizabeth, of, of course, is the head of the church in England. And every monarch, uh, that's one of their titles. They're the head of the church in England because uh, the church, it's a church state set up. Back in the days of the Puritans, the 15, 1600s, the Puritans and the Pilgrims, you had to go to church. You had to tithe. If you didn't, they'd throw you in jail. And uh, you had to support the church. So that's the kind of uh, situation that they came out of. And they got away from it. They wanted religious freedom. They were sick and tired of persecution. America essentially was founded by people. And I call it founded because these are the people who brought uh, civilization to this country. And they brought it over here not seeking gold or seeking uh, wealth. They came over here seeking the Lord. And uh, from Plymouth Rock, uh, the idea of, uh, of freedom and freedom of religion grew and spread throughout this place. I told you last uh, Sunday morning about Roger Williams. He was a Puritan, but he was banished because of, his, uh, because of some of his beliefs. Banished out into the wilderness, as a matter of fact. Roger Williams went out to the Indians, and they accommodated him. And he's the one who founded Providence, Rhode Island, which was the first place on this new world, the first place in this, in this land, where true religious freedom was to be found. All you have to do is do a little reading, and you'll find out that Virginia, early in its history, persecuted uh, Baptist and others. The Baptists have had a hard road to go for a long time at the hands of uh, Catholics and Protestants. The sad thing is that when the Catholics, uh, uh, when the Catholics, uh, for example, during the Spanish Inquisition under Torquemada, they put thousands thousands, tens of thousands to death, burning them at the stake. But then once the Protestants <laughs> had power in their places, they did the same thing. And so it's a vicious cycle. So the Baptists were persecuted in Virginia, and the persecution in Virginia was an outgrowth of the Protestants, and uh, it was a church state set up, brought over from England. The idea was you support the church, you don't go to the church, or we'll throw you in jail. You preach anything different from what we preach, uh, we're going to throw you in jail. And they did. And so uh, this is something that's very seldom ever taught. Fox's Book of Martyrs should be taught in the public school system. The early history of America should be taught in the public school system. Right. I'm talking about not the glossed over, because they never taught us that. When I went to high school, we learned American history. We learned Tennessee history. But they didn't teach, they didn't teach, I never heard anything about Baptists being persecuted in Virginia. William Penn was given a uh, land grant by the king and established what's known today as Pennsylvania. And that was one of the early places in the country that they could flee to and have religious freedom. It was a shining light in its day, Pennsylvania. James Madison, who was the fourth president of the United States, is the father of the Constitution. He's the man who wrote the thing. He's also the man who, uh, who gave the first 10 uh, amendments to the Constitution called the Bill of Rights. James Madison was a Christian. And he, uh, he found out about the persecution of the Baptist in, in Virginia. And he was highly upset over it, very upset. That probably influenced him in writing in the Bill of Rights the freedom of religion. That's one of the great freedoms of being an American, folks, the freedom of religion, a freedom from a state-sponsored religion, a church state set up, where you have to pay taxes to the, to the state to support the church, and you have to attend their church. America had freedom of religion. A uh, president, I think, of uh, one of the countries in South America was interviewed a few decades ago about the difference between North America and South America. 
I don't know if you know much about demographics or read much about stuff like that, but folks, South America is as different from North America as uh, 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 Mongolia is from France. Okay? South America is, is a land blessed with natural resources, courageous people, no doubt about that, people that work hard, no question about that. But the question was posed decades ago, why is it, why is it that North America has prospered so much and South America has not? And South America, folks, many of the places in South America are definitely a third world country. I mean, there's no place in Africa or Haiti or anywhere like that's any worse off than some of the places in South America. So the question was posed, why? Is there such a disparity between the lives of the people in North America and South America? The answer was the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church. That's the difference. Because a church state set up in the South to, keeps the people in bondage, keeps them under the iron hand of the, uh, of the, of the, of the religious hierarchy. Whereas in the North they had religious freedom and they went free and they started building and God blessed them from sea to shining sea. This generation today in 2013 enjoys the fruits of generations of blessings of God in America and they don't appreciate it. They feel this an entitled generation. Now here's why. They have never wanted for anything. Now when I say they, I'm talking about the majority. We have in this country many people who certainly won't. All you have to do is go just a few miles from Knoxville, Tennessee into Appalachia and you'll find kids who walk around on dirt floors and they're barefooted. They don't have running water in their homes. They don't have electricity. You could, it's like stepping back 100 years, 150 years and going back into the woods. That's within 75, 80 miles, 100 miles of Knoxville. You don't have to go far. And uh, I've, been up in, I've been up in Kentucky, preached a revival meeting one time on up in there next to the coal mines in Kentucky. It's quite an experience for me to go up there and see the way the people lived. Everybody doesn't live the same way. But uh, for the most part, Americans have been blessed greatly. We enjoy the fruits of generations that have gone on before us. But why has God blessed this nation so much? Well, I believe the Bill of Rights, written by James Madison, and I believe that Constitution of the United States, based on Christian principles, had a lot to do with it. And religious freedom. When you give people the freedom to go out and work and invent and, and use their mind, and they're not under some church, state, uh, legalistic thing, it's amazing what man can do, especially when God blesses them. God's been good to us. He's been very good to us. I've noticed now in the last year or so in television, uh, there for a while, say let's take go back eight, nine years ago, it was Turkey Day, Turkey Day, Turkey Day. But I have yet to hear from any one of the three local networks anything about Turkey Day. Have you? Do you know why? It's not because they had some great epiphany and all of a sudden decided to give God the glory and be thankful for anything. It's because they probably got a lot of uh, complaints from the Christians in this area. I mean, don't you understand that this politically correct society we live in, you don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to offend the Muslim. We don't want to offend the, uh, the uh, what do they call them, the, uh, what's the Ameri what do they call them, the Indians? Uh, Native Americans. Nobody wants to offend anybody. But when it comes to a Christian, you can say anything you please. The hypocrisy is amazing. Amen. But I've noticed they got the message. I haven't heard Turkey Day yet. And that's good. That's good. I passed by a man's house yesterday on the way home. It's uh, probably from where we are right here. I'd say at the most four or five miles from this building right here. And I was amazed when I looked over into his front yard, there must have been at least 30 to 40 wild turkey everywhere. They were all over the place. Wild turkey everywhere. When I was a kid, I never saw a deer. I never saw a squirrel. I never saw a rabbit. I never saw a turkey. Not in Knoxville, Tennessee. 
take my word for it. Why? Because if they saw them, they ate them. <laughs> you better believe it. Back in those days, if, a, if they could get their hands on it, they'd eat it. And uh, people back then didn't have steaks like we have today. And so, uh, you know, these critters didn't run, <laughs> run wild. Uh, three days ago, I stood in my kitchen. I looked out in the woods behind my house, and that always looked like about a, a six, eight-point buck. You know, just walking through the woods. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I was standing on the back porch looking down into the backyard, and there stood a doe looking up at me. Just like that, right there. So I've got deer running through my backyard all the time, <coughs> turkey. Uh, about a year ago, I saw a flock of turkey came through, looked about eight or ten of them. Nowhere near as many as this guy had, but they came right through the backyard. I've had red fox in there. I've had everything in the world in there. And, uh, you know, all these critters are out here running around now. It could be that uh, that's an indication or sign of something to come. I don't know. But God's been good to us. He's been good to me. I've had far more than my parents ever had. My parents never had anything because they divorced when I was a baby, separated. So I didn't know anything about what a home would be like with a mother and a father. I had a good grandmother and a good grandfather, thank God, and they gave me a home. And for that I will ever be thankful. But I have had more, probably wasted more, probably thrown away more than my mother and father and grandmother and grandfather ever had, ever had. And I think about that, and I think about how thankful that I am or I should be because of that. Because one of the worst sins, I think, in the Bible is unthankfulness. Because of all the things that you can do for God and you can give the Lord, He's already done for you and given to you. He's given you everything you have, what you have that God didn't give you. But the one thing you can give Him that He didn't give you is thankfulness. And so that characterizes this generation, unthankful and unholy. Now Black Friday will be coming up. And then uh, what's that thing Monday, what do they call that? Cyber Monday when you get on the Internet. And uh, last year, I think, or the year before, a couple of people were trampled to death, one of them in a Walmart and someone somewhere else, when they opened the doors and the crowd came through to get to whatever they wanted to buy, whatever they were doing that Friday, and they were trampled to death. And uh, and usual, if there's some hot uh, item on sale for, you know, the toys, there's always some toy that's hot for whatever year it is. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is this year. I've seen women fight, jerk their hair out, and beat each other over a toy so that they could get it for, you know, for their grandchild or for their child or whatever the case may be. <laughs> uh, puts you in the Christmas spirit real fast, won't it? It puts you in a spirit, won't it, brother? But the greatest thing that you can do is to gather around with somebody you love and somebody you care, somebody you care for, and just look them eyeball to eyeball and thank God in your heart for what He's given you. They may not be with you this time next year. They may not be here. Now, your car, your boat, your house, your clothes, your bank account, your money, this, this, that, your stuff won't mean a thing to you when you lose that loved one. You won't mean a thing to you. And, and that's just something that affects our character. It affects the way we see things, the way we think. It's thankfulness. There are things that I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for God raising me up off the bed. As our sister said last year, I remember when your daughter was over there at UT. I went over there and prayed with her, prayed with her many times, prayed for her, prayed for her, because she was in a horrible accident, a lot of pain. And it wasn't long before that when I was flat on my back, flat on my back. And uh, weeks a week, I'd never been as weak as that. That was weak. I just, I don't think people, I don't people understand how weak you get when your heart gets down like that. Weak. So weak at times is all I could do to raise my head. But God's raised me up. He's raised me up. He's raised me up. And uh, he called me to preach. And I, that's why I'm here. And that's, that's, that's why I want to be here. I've told him time and again, God, if you're done with me, if you don't want me to preach anymore, if you're finished with me, uh, I'm ready. I'm ready. I've settled that in that closet with the door shut and the lights out 
on my knees and my face buried in the carpet. I settled that. Not with a man, not with a church, but with God. Ready. But it's given me an appreciation for things that really matter. The ministry matters. Your family matters. Your faith in Christ matters. Your witness and your testimony matters. There's a new year coming up. The pagans will get out and they'll sing all dang Zion and they'll get drunk and they'll, they'll have revelry all night long, wake up the next day with a throbbing headache and hangover. Uh, I go to bed on New Year's Eve and go to sleep and forget it. This is meaningless to me as it can be. What matters to me is that day I got saved. That's my new year every year. That's the new year for me. That, that's what counts. That's what matters. And things matter to me. Some things mean a lot to me, and I'm thankful for them. I'm so thankful that I can stand up here tonight before you. I had a lot of stuff prepared. I, had a lot of, I did a lot of work in here today with this book by uh, William Grady. This is an outstanding book. What Hath God Wrought? A Biblical Interpretation of American History. This is a smart man, William Grady. And uh, this is his history. It's a history book is what it is. And it's kind of, it's a running commentary type history. And it's got a lot of good material in here. A lot of things that are very helpful and useful. It would be a wonderful thing if every high school student in America, somewhere along, I don't know, 8, 9, 10th grade, somewhere in there, that they could take, go through a, a year with this book right here. That book right there would give them a good perspective on history. Of course, it'll never happen. It won't happen because it's, it's written from the perspective of a Christian. And that's a different, uh, a different uh, a picture altogether. But he does say something in here that I think I'd, I'd like to read for you tonight because it's so good. It's good in the sense that it, uh, it gives us an idea of what we ought to be thankful for tonight. Now, Will Durant has a, a series of books called The History of Civilization or The Story of Civilization. How many ever heard of Will Durant? Will and Ariel Durant. Well, I've got that set in my office. Uh, it's 11 or 12 volumes. I forget how many. My mother gave me those books 30-something uh, years ago. She read. My mother would read. And uh, she wanted me to have these books. And she was particularly interested in what Will Durant had to say about Christ. She wanted to know what he said about him. And Will Durant is a un un uh, unquestioned scholar, a historical secular scholar. All right? He's a historian. You don't just brush off what he says as some uh, lame brain fanatic. You have to deal with it. And according to what William Grady says, Will Durant's work, The History of Civilization, is the work on history that everything else is judged by. So I've got the books. And uh, I haven't read all of them, but I've read a lot of the material in the books. And he talks about Christ. And he, uh, he talks about him as an historical figure allowing for the fact that this man really lived. And 2,000 years ago, and then he quotes the secular authorities for it, Suetonius, uh, Pliny the Elder, and so forth and so on. Goes through all that. Everybody knows about all them. And so, therefore, you know, he lays the foundation down for the fact that Christ lived. Now, whether, whether uh, Will Durant ever, ever became a true believer in Christ or not, I don't know. That's between him and God. I have no idea. But if he's going to be a legitimate historian, he has to deal with whether or not this man lived. So if someone comes up to you and tells you they don't even believe Jesus Christ ever lived, feel sorry for them, okay? You're looking at an idiot. That's as nice as I know how to be about it. You're listening to a fool. Someone who's never taken the time to, to, uh, to check into the history of what's going on. There is an enormous amount of historical evidence that the Lord Jesus Christ lived. Now, I don't need secular history to prove to me that He lived. But if you're weak in the faith, if you're a fence straddler, if you're not sure, if you're just coming on and learning things, it might be good for you to know that, uh, that there's an ample amount of evidence that he lived. Josephus was a first century historian. He was a Jew. He was there when Titus destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And Josephus makes clear reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Clear reference to Him. No question about it. So Will Durant is a historian and uh, he writes about the persecution, the burning at the stake, the agony and the suffering of the Christians at the hands of, the, at the, uh, at the hands of Torquemada and the Spanish Inquisition, 
uh, Mary, Bloody Mary in England, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in the many places in Europe that they were persecuted. One day we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ, folks. It's called the beam over there in 1 Corinthians. And you're going to meet those folks. You're going to meet them. It's going to be quite a day when you meet somebody that was burned at the stake. It's going to be quite a day when you look at the one who burned them at the stake. That they, when they stand at the great white throne judgment. That's going to be something. All judgment is given to the hands of the Son of God. Well, he writes about it. Uh, Brother Grady, page 37. He talked about how they burned the people. I won't, I, I'm not going to read every word of it. But it says at the first, the procedure, and this is quoting, this is quoting Durant now. He's quoting Will Durant. At first, the procedure was simple. Those condemned to death were marched to the public plaza. They were bound in tears on a pyre. The inquisitors sat in state on a platform facing it. A last appeal for confessions was made. The sentences were read. The fires were lit. The agony was consummated. But as burnings became more frequent and suffered some loss in their psychological power, the ceremony was made more complex and awesome. A ceremony out of it. You see, they perfected it. They turned it into a spectacle. And was staged with all the care and cost of a major theatrical performance. Those who were judged guilty of major heresy but denied it to the end were by the intention of the Inquisition abandoned to an everlasting hell. These were led out from the city between throngs that gathered with, from leagues around for this holiday spectacle. Arrived at the place prepared for execution, the confessed were strangled, then burned. The recalcitrant, in other words, those who would not deny their faith, were burned alive. The fires were fed till nothing remained of the dead but ashes, which were scattered over fields and streams. The priests and spectators returned to their altars and their homes, convinced that a propitiatory offering had been made to a God insulted by heresy. Human sacrifice had been restored. And of course, when you live in a church state set up that the pilgrims were fleeing, you have no voice. If they want to burn you at a stake, they'll burn you at a stake. They burned them at Smithfield. They burned them at Smithfield and other places in England. If they want to do that, they'll do that. But James Madison, James Madison wrote a letter to William Bradford's son, William Bradford Jr. If you'll remember, William Bradford was uh, the second governor of Plymouth Colony. William Bradford was a pilgrim. James Madison was the fourth president of the United States. He wrote a letter to William Bradford Jr. and in it he talked about the horrible, to paraphrase him, I don't remember word for word, but he talked about the horrible persecutions of Virginia. He despised it. He might not have agreed with every point of doctrine with the people being persecuted, but he despised the idea that a man would not have religious freedom. Everywhere the Baptists have gone in the past, They've been the champions of religious freedom. And folks, if you lose your religious freedom, you've lost it all. When the Internal Revenue Service, in, in, uh, in 1913, the, uh, the uh, income tax was instituted. And when the income tax was instituted, it wasn't instituted, of course, with a vote. The first thing they did was to... Uh, to, uh, to, to uh, 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 create the Federal Reserve on Jekyll Island in Georgia. Along with the Federal Reserve that was created on, in, on Jekyll Island, Georgia, to control the money supply of the United States, along with that, the, the federal income tax was created. Uh, before that, people didn't pay federal income taxes. And when the federal income tax was created, uh, it was accepted, exacted its taxes to pay for the government, pay for the operation of the government. But what happens, as with so many different things, that down through the years, the federal government began to categorize people in groups, and they'd give out what's called a 5013C. A 5013C is a tax-exempt organization. They're tax-exempt. That means that a church like this or another organization similar to it does not have to pay taxes 
on the offerings that come into the church. Now, I know there's been a lot of abuse. No question. I'll be the first one to admit that. No question about it. A lot of 5013C organizations have uh, been handling a lot of money and, 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 and uh, in, in, in illegal ways and what have you. But the federal government, through the tax system, through the IRS, had to define what was a 5013C, in other words, what was a religious institution qualifying for tax exempt status. So the old standard mainline churches, like a Baptist church, like this church, we're a church. Anybody knows that? They don't have to look long. They'll find that out. That's what we do. This is a church. This is not a front for some kind of a business where we're laundering money. But here's the problem. After a while, they began to, de they began to delve into what was theology. What you should preach or what you shouldn't preach. They're at a line right now where they're determining, uh, dictating to churches what is right theology and what's wrong theology. They're crossing a very fuzzy line. They're, they're getting into uncharted territory. And of course the idea is that if you don't qualify then you lose your 5013C status where you have to pay taxes on the church, uh, on the offerings that come into the church. And what does that amount to? That amounts to control. That's exactly what it is. It's control. When the federal government, through taxation, can control what's preached from the pulpit, you have the same setup that you have in Russia, China, North Korea just executed a number of people. That monster that rules in North Korea, he executed a bunch of his own people. Do you know what their horrible crime was? They were found with a Bible. They had a Bible. They died because they had the Word of God, a Bible. Aren't you thankful tonight that you've got a Bible? And you can read it. This is not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that I was born in this country. It's not lady luck, oh fortunata. That had nothing to do with it. That's a lot to be thankful for. The Word of God. William Tyndall paid a dear price for giving the Word of God to the average Englishman. So did John Wycliffe. So did all the rest of them over there. To give you the Word of God. I'm thankful for that tonight. Since it's so precious and since God gave us His Word, I think it behooves all of us tonight to read it, don't you? Father, in thy name we pray. In Jesus' name I pray. There's no other reason for us to be here tonight, Lord, but to glorify thee and exalt your holy name. Give me the grace of God, Heavenly Father, to stand true to your word, true to my calling. My Father, in thy name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen.